light on me. I can barely see y'all. It's like, I need my shades just so I can see everyone out here. <laughs> All right, well, good morning. Is it morning? Wait, is it, is it morning? Am I? It's, at the, it's 2 o'clock. You're right. It's afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> it's good to see everyone. Um, should we, people record, should we get started now? Okay, the recording's on. Hey, people online. Everyone say hey to people online. Hey. I had no clue that this class was going to be streamed, so mommy, I'm sorry. <laughs> I text you. <laughs> um, first off, I want to thank everyone for coming into this class. I think coming into this class, we are all admitting that we are all jacked up. Right? Is that amen? Like we, let's just acknowledge that. We all admit that we're jacked up. That's why we're here. So we got a common bond. All right, <laughs> from the very beginning. Uh, just so you guys know, my name is Paris Cunningham. This is my wife. Zainabu Cunningham. <laughs> um, we lead the church in Princeton, New Jersey, uh, the Mercer Church of Christ. And we're grateful uh, to be able to, to share in this topic today. Uh, we have a lot uh, to be talking about. We've, we've been doing ministry for about 17 years now, or 15, 15 years uh, was in the Bronx, New York. Uh, so we got some New Yorkers in here. Oh, y'all gonna act like y'all quiet. Y'all go ahead, just boast. You know you're New Yorkers. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, uh, we're in the Bronx, New York, uh, and then we transitioned over to Mercer County, and it's been really awesome uh, to serve in the ministry there. We have two young kids, uh, Sean, who is nine years old, uh, and Amina, who is six years old. They're in the back. Uh, looking beautiful as ever. Um, I don't want mean to put too much pressure on them. <laughs> but yeah, so a little bit about our family background. Since we're talking about dysfunction, let's jump into some dysfunction. Uh, you know, I was born actually in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, it's a desert area, who would have thought? Okay, another Arizona. There we go. All right. <laughs> you know, so born in Tucson, Arizona. My mom, a uh, single mom. My dad was around, um, but my father, he, he was caught up in gang life. Um, ended up in, a, in Arizona, there's a three strikes law. And he got caught on his third strike having a dime bag of marijuana that cost him 10 years um, in jail. And so during that period of time, my mother pretty much had to raise me, my younger brother, and my, my sister uh, by herself. Mm -hmm. And for any single moms, you know, that's, that's not easy. And so she worked many hours and uh, was trying to navigate that. And through that process, I think it just took a toll on even her. And she ended up getting caught up in a drug addiction. And drug addiction was just a part of my family. Uh, from crack to heroin um, to meth. I mean, this was something that was just like strung out within my family. So gang life, drugs, addiction uh, was just a big part of my, just me growing up. Um, so we ended up moving to Georgia, all right, ATL. So we got some Atlanteans here or some Georgians, all right? <laughs> and uh, kind of that, the plan was that life would get better going to Georgia. Uh, we'll be with a little more family, but actually it got worse. Um, you know, my mom went from really kind of carrying the house and, and holding everything down to, you know, the addiction really took over around that time. Uh, and in my teen years in high school, uh, I had to work two jobs while in high school to kind of help pay bills and, and navigate that. And, and it was just, it was hard. It was hard, you know. I ended up getting saved, becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ in 05, uh, up in Kennesaw area, uh, Georgia. And, you know, there was a journey that I had to go through to become even <laughs> half the person that I am now trying to be, you know, because there's so much I had to work through. But this is part of my story. It's part of my story. It wasn't all pretty. Matter of fact, it still ain't all pretty. Uh, and we're going to talk about some details on what I had to learn and how we had to kind of navigate through some of that. I want to let my wife share a little bit. And um, yes, my name is Zainabu, and 
a little bit about my story is that I grew up and, you know, both, both parents were in the household, um, but they weren't really, they were there but not together. It was more so out of like, it's just easier, like, <laughs> these bills are hard, we could just make it work together, that kind of thing. The love wasn't really there. At the age of eight, my mom passed away. At the three years later, my dad passed away. Wow. And um, after that, I did go to live with an aunt who was not, was phys not physically, but mentally and emotionally abusive. So that was hard, especially at that time. I was getting, I was in preteen, going into preteen teen, and um, not much was given to us in terms of funds to even get clothes. I remember a year having to wear like the same shoes for like a whole year, and um, because and it was too small, you know, like not having everything that you would want, right, or need. I mean scratch want, what you need, yeah. okay? And then um, a few years later, I was there with my sister, and because my aunt felt like, I'm gonna get into the teen years, I'm probably gonna be rebellious, what ends up happening is she ended up giving up her rights and putting me into foster care. After my sister had already turned 18, she put me into foster care. I have to say, it was a blessing in disguise, because my foster mom was really, we didn't always see eye to eye, but the love was there. She actually is the one that walked me down the aisle. But growing up, losing parents, going into foster care, I struggled with abandonment and loneliness. And, you know, coming into the church, I ended up getting baptized when I was like a sophomore in college. And I was excited because I had been crying out to God, like, help me, help me, I need you, I need you. And the interesting thing enough is that I grew up in a Muslim household, but I went to <laughs> Catholic school. You know, like, it was, it was a mixture. So I just knew how to pray. And I just remember during that time in college, just praying out to God, like, I need you, I need you. And I was met. I started studying the Bible, and I just thought everything would be, like, amazing. Like, I got baptized. Everything in the past is in the past. But what I've come to realize, which we'll talk a little bit about, is God calls you to different spaces to deal with those hurts, deal with those things that you have gone through in order to move forward. Amen. So with that, man, the... the if you read the description of this class, it has a funny statement where it says, dysfunction is the gift that keeps on giving. How many of us could agree with that sentiment? <laughs> All right? You know, and I think it's so true because, you know, growing up, we could, we could acknowledge we came from some dysfunction, right? We could acknowledge that our background and our past and how we were raised, there were some problems with it. But then when we have children of our own, all of a sudden, we start trying to bring that stuff into our parenting. Actually, we actually make it sound like it was a good thing. You know, there's many times where I found myself lamenting uh, that my kids aren't as independent as I was when I was their age. I was like, man, when I was their age, you know, I was watching the house. I stayed home by myself, and, and I was doing all this stuff. Like, we should be able to let them do that. But then I had to remember, I was at home by myself because my mom had to work like two, three jobs. That wasn't something that she was doing because she wanted an independent seven-year-old. You know what I mean? Like that was something that she had no choice, you know? But yet I'm sitting here, the way you reframe, you reframe it in your mind, like, oh, that's, hey, you know, back in my day, we was, like this, you know, like everything was great. Or even for me, like sometimes we could get into this mindset where, you know, my children, they're so comfortable with asking me questions about why are we doing this and where are we going? And I was like, man, when I was a kid, 
asking all these questions. Where are we going? Why are we going here? Let me know how they feeling about stuff. <laughs> how you feeling? <laughs> what? You know, and I'm sitting here like, man, if I would have asked my parents, if I would have had those conversations with my parents, and then again, not acknowledging that my parents' short temper, their inability to communicate or navigate emotions with me, right? That was not a calculated parental tactic, right? That was a response to trauma and pain. That's what she was dealing with and she, they were going through. And so that was their response to struggle. See, I didn't get the best from my parents emotionally and spiritually because they struggled so hard to provide for me physically. That compounded with their undealt mental and emotional issues, it made things so hard for them. And yet sometimes we could find ourselves kind of romanticizing our origin stories, right? You know, I shared in the earlier lesson I was able to do here for the ILC about, uh, you know, when I studied the Bible, one of the big lessons I got from studying the Bible is that the gospel has to first be personal before it could be communal. That the gospel has to first be personal. And you got to apply it to yourself. And, and in short, you have to deal in order to heal. And this is our first point. We got two little points that we're going to make and we're going to pass it over to some experienced giants that are going to give us some incredible practicals on how to navigate this stuff. But I know for us, we had to learn to deal with our stuff before we could heal. Romans 12, verse 1, we know the scripture. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The scripture says, do not conform to the pattern. We all have patterns, right? We all have patterns, habits, routines, orders, preferences, right? Practices and quirks. But we also have character patterns. And how we respond, how we process information and situations, fight or flight, these are all patterns of our character. You know, the funny thing about our personal character patterns is that they are almost always obvious to other people and invisible to yourself, right? Other people can see them loud and clear, but sometimes for us, we don't see it. It's hard for us to see. It's invisible to us, especially in the moment. So the question is, how do you deal to heal? What does it look like to deal to heal? And I think the first thing we want to talk about is that you have to know your patterns. You have to know your patterns. And what does that mean? Really, it means to know your story. Like, how connected are you with your story? With your parents' story? Where you come from? You know, talking through my story and counseling helped me so much. And I know sometimes as Christians, we can have this stigma towards counseling. And I really want to encourage you guys, that's so important. You know, sometimes you need to be able to sit down and learn, what are my triggers? Learning the origin to some of my schemas that I have that are developing. You know, it's funny how we could spend our whole lives learning about everything outside of us and know so little about everything inside of us. You know, this is why we don't take our health seriously until it's too late. And it's the same with our mental and spiritual health. And I think it's really important that we're able to allow learning who we are, where we come from, what we've dealt with, and how it impacts us in order to change it. Oh, okay. All right. She's like, keep going. The other thing is, you have, to re you have to embrace the renewed mind. 
and this is important, you know, intentionally setting yourself up to practice new patterns. Once you learn your patterns and you know the things that you have that are in-baked within your character, look, my family struggled with addiction. That's a huge thing. I thought I got exempt from that. <laughs> the addiction just manifested itself in different ways. It probably wasn't drugs. It probably wasn't alcohol. But, oh, it manifested itself in other things. And I had to navigate, okay, God, how do I navigate this? What does it look like for me to see and, and trap this? And I had to learn these patterns. You know, intentionally setting yourself up to practice new patterns. Thinking in advance on how you can, you know, so, for example, for us, my parents, my mom especially, had a very short temper. Very short temper. So discipline wasn't necessarily discipline. It was abuse. And for all that God has showed me and taught me and helped me with, I learned for me, oh my goodness, I could lean into that same thing with my children. I could lean into that very quickly. And so I had to learn a couple things. I had to practice to create new patterns. That pow pow stick, I was like, okay, we can give a little pow pow, but there are some rules that we had to establish. First off, it was this one little spoon. Second, for us, it had to be placed somewhere far away where I had to actually go find it. And that was so important. Little thing, but it was important because it made me walk and think. And not to respond emotionally and in anger. You know what I mean? And the third thing is age limit, meaning age appropriate pow pows. So if you three, one, two, three. You know what I mean? Like, and that was, it was so. That was important because it, uh, it helped establish a new pattern for me. Where no, you don't, you don't discipline out of anger. You don't discipline out of emotion. You discipline out of intention. And it's purposeful. To the point that really that didn't even, that was like the very last option. If really, if it even came up. That was transformative because that's not how I was raised. At all. So it was a new pattern. All right, and um, something that helped me is even just going through scripture, right? I realized even when it came to parenting, there's no perfect example, right, in scripture. But we serve a perfect God that's able to equip us all with wisdom and discernment on what to do. And I thought even getting, you know, becoming a mom, I was excited, you know, but there was, there was one time, there was something that happened. I remember us driving, and all of a sudden, I burst out into tears. And Paris was like, what's going on? Oh, I know you're pregnant, but what's going on? <laughs> and I'm like, you know what dawned on me? What's going to happen when my kids ask, where are their grandparents? I was like, they're not, they don't have any. And that was the beginning of God helping me to peel the layers of healing, of even going after other relationships. You know, staying close to God is a must because we are not perfect, but we serve a perfect God. And in spite of the things we have experienced or are experiencing, he is at work. And as you go through your journey with God, you end up in different seasons at different times. And God is there to peel all the layers. One of my favorite scriptures is 2 Corinthians 12, 8 to 10. But I read it in the Passion Translation. It says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to relieve me of this, but he answered me. My grace is always more than enough for you. And my power finds its full expression through your weakness. So I will celebrate my weaknesses. For when I am weak, I sense more deeply the mighty power of Christ living in me. So I am not defeated by my weaknesses, but delighted. For when I feel my weakness and endure mistreatment, when I'm surrounded with troubles on every side and face persecution because of my love for Christ, I am made yet stronger. For my weakness becomes a portal to God's power. Helping you to deal with you know, God helps you to deal with things so you can be all he created you to be. At many times, I felt like 
what I, got, what I have gone through is a weakness. And it's even hard to share at times because I'm like, I don't want to have that story. Why, why, why? But it happened, and that is my story. But in it, I'm going to still work through being the parent that God's called me to be, right? The mom, but I had to heal. Therapy as well has been essential for me. And we're going to share the last point, which is also has been essential. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the beautiful things that we have in the church that I don't think we always make the most of is the community. You know, growing up, man, I had all types of aunts, uncles, and everything, just to only realize when I got older that they weren't blood. <laughs> I'm like, man, that's my auntie so-and-so, that's uncle so-and-so. And I was like, wait a minute, y'all, we ain't, we ain't blood related? Like, how are you just giving everybody a title like this? We just do that, we just throwing it around, like, everybody auntie. I don't even know you like that, you know? But, and this is, this is how we grew up, you know, for my, for, you know, I don't know if anyone's like me, that's how I grew up, was raised that way, you know? And then, but it's so funny because we live in a culture now where everyone is so isolated. I don't know you, and how are you keeping everyone to yourselves? And again, let me be clear. I understand. Things get crazy. We got a lot of these aunties, uncles, and stuff happens. Let's not act like it. You know what I mean? Like, so I get it. I do get it. But God has always... God's expectation was for us to work in collaboration, not in isolation, not in isolation. Community is so important. We need each other. You know, along this journey, it's so important for us to make sure that we are working together in building our children, raising our children, not in isolation, but tribe, in a tribe. And it's important to ask, who is your tribe? Who do you bring in to help out? Who's supporting you? Who are the spiritual aunties and uncles, spiritual brothers and sisters, big brothers and sisters? You know, we've all went through this global pandemic together. And as great as it's been to have Zoom and technology to kind of be a, a great supporter, one thing that I think has been a, a down draw is that we don't connect and engage with each other anymore. And I think the people who've suffered the worst from this are our children because now we don't go to other people's house and you know you got to think twice are we gonna go over there I you know you, I heard I heard that cough I don't know <laughs> I don't know you know what I mean like you sure you want to be oh you know we feeling weird now we got monkey pox out here you know it's always something you know what I mean like I can't trust nobody you know you scratch it now I'm like I don't know why are you scratching you scratching and coughing it's a problem, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, and and that, that has been so dangerous where we're not trusting one another. How do we get back to this? How do we get back to this? You know, the power of the scripture in Romans, and I just want to kind of close. We want to make sure we got time to hear, hear these practicals here. The power of the scripture in Romans that we just shared in Romans 12 is that this scripture has a promise. It has a promise. This scripture gives one of the greatest promises in the Bible. And that promise is that if you want to know God's will, here's how you do it. Here's how you do it. You know, we tend to think it's uh, not conforming that will let us know God's will. Right? As long as I don't conform to the pattern of the world, then I'll know God's will. But it's more literally, this scripture is saying that when you offer your body as a living sacrifice, then you will know God's will. And us being willing to actually go back, especially as parents, there's no perfect parent. But us being able to sit down and be like, God, how can I offer myself, me? How can I deal so I can heal? How can I, how can I build the community that you're calling me to build? so I could have a collaborative work on how to parent my children best. Understanding that I'm coming from some dysfunction and I'm trying to walk in your glory. Let me get that support, let me get that help, let me sacrifice my 
pattern to glorify you and for my children to see more of you and less of me. Amen? Amen. Thank you, guys. Hop along. Thanks. Um, well, uh, my name is Sonny Ryan, and this is my beautiful wife, Kim. And uh, we, we definitely uh, come from different, uh, different patterns of dysfunction. Uh, I grew up in a non-religious household uh, with addiction, physical abuse, emotional abuse, prison, like anything you can have. You, very, very rarely do we have water and electricity on at the same time. Like the, the amount of dysfunction, just say it was a lot. Uh, but the crazy part is, is how incredible God is in our story. And if you're here, it means God in some way has intervened in your story. And so no matter where our families are at spiritually, it's always important to know that it doesn't depend on us as parents. Like God can always intervene in our lives and in the lives of our children. Amen. But uh, Kim and I, we've been uh, married about 22 years. Uh, we've been disciples 26, 25 years. I have a 19-year-old freshman in college and a 16-year-old junior in high school. And uh, Kim and I always say that we, God thought it would be funny to find out how many issues you could have in one family with two children. Because we have so many issues, you think I have seven kids. You know, I got boy and girl issues. I got adopted issues and biological issues. I got white issues and brown issues. I got introverted issues and extroverted issues. I got athletic issues and, uh, and, and artistic issues. <laughs> They're polar opposites in every human capacity known to man. And then you add that to me and my wife being polar opposites, and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> you know how like, you, you start doing something right with one your kid, and you're like, yes, I have figured this out. We'll just do it with the next kid. And they're the opposite, and then you look up to God, and you go, why? <laughs> like, why? But even through that, if that wasn't enough, we've had chronic health issues, financial challenges, adoption-related issues, racial issues you know when my when your son comes home in the first grade and says I don't want to be black please please let me be white I, I don't know where to go with that when your daughter says I no longer believe in God because I cry myself to sleep in chronic pain every night asking for God to take the pain away and every day when I wake up I'm still in 9 10 pain so when I share this it's from a place of struggle so you've come to a place of struggle. And if you, if you don't, don't want to have courage and turn to God and rely on God, parenting is not for you. <laughs> I'm just being honest. Parenting is hard. If you think it should be easy, you're wrong. I just want you to think about all that you have put God through. And when you, when you start to say, but this ain't fair, I just want you to think all the things you have done where God has been in heaven, well, are you serious right now? Yeah. And just be reminded just for a second. I, I'm going to say, I'm going I'm to start with one, a, a few things that I think I have to say, even though we're not going to dwell on them. Number one is your relationship with God has got to be on point. Transforming families is supernatural, guys. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts the world of sin, judgment, and righteousness. So if you pretend like this is some kind of behavioral therapy session that you can manipulate your kids into being who you want them to be, you are wrong. That's not how you were transformed. You guys with me here? So you've got to be prayerful. You have to, be, you have to fast for your kids. You, you, you've got to be willing to change who you are for your kids. You've got to be deeply rooted in God. And number two is you've got to be deeply rooted in community. Because you have no idea what you're doing. Let me tell you something. If you think you got your kids figured out, just give it a year or a day. And you'll, be, you'll figure it out real quick. I don't have this figured out. Because every new season of year is going to bring a different thing. And lastly, is if you're married, you have to model your marriage has got to be the foundation of your family. It has to be the center of your family not your kids. So if the kids come first in your marriage, you have something out of order. Yeah. 
If you're not married, you have to find deep friendships where you can model deep friendships with another sister, another brother. You must have someone in your life where they see true connection and friendship and spirituality lived out, even if they don't live with you, which means you have to have community. Does that make sense? So I'm saying all that. Now I wanna, we're gonna run through just a few things. I'm, I'm gonna give you a principle, but I'm gonna tell you some practicals on how we've tried to apply it. Because people would say have family devotionals, and then I had no idea what they were talking about because nobody ever had a family devotional. And then I'd go home and do it all wrong and be frustrated and then think nobody becomes more like Jesus from family devotionals. <laughs> okay? So I'm gonna try to make, so our part is gonna be really practical, but I had to get all that out of the way, okay? So number one, a new legacy begins with a new identity. Uh, Frank Kim uh, recommended, I moved to Denver about six and a half years ago. I said, Frank, I want your best book on parenting. And he said, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families. And in that book, there's a part about how an airplane, I love the analogy, it says an airplane when in flight is off course 90% of the time. But because of turbulence, because of air traffic, because of whatever it is, the wind, the weather, so you're constantly, it's not on a perfect straight line, it's constantly off course just a little bit almost all the time but it gets where it's going because it has a destination and it says as parents we're going to be off course our families are going to be off course 90 percent of the time in some small way due to circumstances life but if we have a destination if we have an identity as a family that we're aiming for we can always come back and i thought man this is really cool so i decided that i was going to come up with the cute slogan for our family i was going to brand our family in the name of Jesus Christ. I had this grand plan about how it would work. I would suggest some really witty thing. And my, my kids who were preteens would nod, Dad, that's amazing. And my wife would go, yes, honey, yes. No. It ended up being like this huge paragraph of things. Because I asked, the, who, who is God calling us to be uniquely as a family? Who are we? What are our gifts? What does that look like when we are, in, you know, when we are, being like Jesus, when we're really loving people, what does that look like for our family? And we came up with this thing. And if you walk into our house, it's framed in glass, in museum glass. And everything that we do goes back to being who God has called us to be. So it's not just teaching our kids what to do or what to believe, but who they are in the image of God. So one thing that we've always done is we, we read our family vision statement and say, what do we want to work on this week as a family? And they said, we want to work on being more grateful. And then that whole week, we'd find scriptures every day and go back to our things. But we're always pointing this. We are men and women created in the image of God, and we are grateful. Does that make sense? So that's one, one, one way uh, that we've uh, kind of tried to apply this scripture of this identity. Because we get that when we become Christians, right? 2 Corinthians 5, 17, right? In Christ, you have become a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Um, the other thing is we play offense, not just defense, which means we have to be instructional, not just correction. It means we got to play offense and, you know, train a child in the way they should go. It doesn't just say correct the child as they go. It says train a child. It means being proactive. And I remember um, being in um, church and our kids were on the front row and uh, we had our kids sitting in church through communion and then they would go to Kingdom Kids for their lesson and we'd hear the sermon. Well, my kids were little and you know how kids are, right? And we're on the front row, guys. And so they're in their chairs and my son's like, oh, Thursday, and he's sliding out this. And my daughter's like, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored. And I'm like, the whole congregation is by me, 200 people. And you're like, I will kill you. You will see Jesus today. Stop it, stop it. You're getting a spanking. You're getting spankings every day for a week. No TV until you're 20. Like, you are like, anything you can to stop. The people are looking to stop. Stop it. Don't. Just stop. And it's, we tried everything. And when everything failed, we tried training. <laughs> yeah, so we had this, we had this family um, in our church and they were having the same issue and I promise you not like every and we were leading the church in Cleveland like everybody's like looking at you like what's wrong with your kid right Josiah's like sliding out of the seat on the front row and you know you're 
pulling his hair and threatening him. And so we were like, we got to figure something out. So we, this is just a practical, I'm telling you, we do not know what we're doing. We've learned trial by fire. So we had this devotional with this other family and we were like, we're just going to reverse the roles and we're just going to role play. And so the four adults were the four kids and we were pretending we were at church on Sunday and we start acting a fool. I mean, we are like over exaggerating what they did, but it was still pretty close. So we're like doing all this and they're like, no, that's not right. You're not supposed to act like that. And we're like, really? Interesting. So then every Sunday, like on the way to church, we would talk about, like we would remind them about the skit and then they were like, oh, oh no, no, you can't do that. That's not, no, you can't do that in church. And we were like, "Uh aha, you know, so I'm like something so simple as like role reversal. They were like really freaked out at the way we were acting but honestly it fixed the problem so (laughs) whatever works there's something about talking to our kids when there's not an issue about something there's something about incorporating play and humor into the lesson that helps them lower their guard and defenses and have an aha moment and so we've got to constantly as parents be creative and if you're not creative it's okay because we have community There's so many parents. How did you navigate this? How did you navigate teaching your kids what they're doing in church? And sometimes you'll get to another couple and they're like, we don't know either. I'm like, let's try something because what we're doing is not working. You know what I'm saying? And so that that's one of the big things is try not to be all corrective in your parents. Try try to build in those times where you're playing offense and training. Um, The other thing is uh, planting seeds, not planned events. So one of the mistakes I made is I knew I should have family devotionals. So I planned this big event every week in our family. We will be, we are going to love Jesus, whether you like it or not. And my kids were a little small, and I planned these 20-minute devotionals for a (laughs) two-year-old. I don't recommend it. So what would happen in our family devotion is I would try to go 20 minutes with a two-year-old, being frustrated the whole time. Stop. Don't move. Listen. Stop. And so I ended up yelling at the kids. Kim is looking at me like, you or the worst father who's ever lived. <laughs> she never said that, but I knew what she meant. Literally, I used, to, I used to think no one ever becomes more like Jesus in a family devotional. You know what happens in a family devotional? You yell at your kids, your wife is not happy with you, and you all go to bed like really discontent <laughs> and a little insecure. That's what happens at family devotionals. But I, I equated spirituality with events, not seeds. Like these small seeds that you plant along the way. You know, that is, that is the principle of the sower, right? A man reaps what he sows. You ne- here's, what, here's what's really funny. When a, when a farmer plants a seed, it's not the significance or the size of the seed. It's a trusting that God has a process. That if I plant the seed and I do right by it, it will grow. Does that make sense? And so the size of the harvest is not the size of the seed. It's the amount of small seeds that are sown. And so getting these little touch points, dinner time. Are you wasting dinner time? Are you you planting small seeds? Are you making the most of every opportunity? You know what I'm saying? I'm going to let Kim share a little bit about planting seeds and making the most of every opportunity. Yeah, so Sonny shared a, a little bit how he was raised. I was raised the total opposite. I think that when people think dysfunction, they think like major, like event dysfunction, right? I grew up, I was at church every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Sunday night. I was part of every youth group, every church choir, the handbell choir, the puppet team, the ushering team. Like, I mean, we lived at church, right? And so outside of my parents um, getting divorced when I was 10, if you looked at my family, it, was, it seemed normal, but no, because our dysfunction was passive aggressiveness, manipulation. <laughs> you just don't talk about it. You pretend like it didn't happen, right? And so, you know, that, that's a little bit how, how I was raised. But the point of this is, even though I went, I had all these amazing things that, you know, our church provided and that my parents had us go to, it made me no closer to God at the end of the day. When I left home at 17, my dysfunction came from 17 to age 27 when I finally became a Christian. 
you know, because I go, well, and I'm not slamming programs. They're amazing. They're awesome. But those are not going to be the things that, you know, are going to teach your kids how to walk with God. I had no clue. I really didn't really even know that much about God coming out of, you know, all of those years of, of events and things like that. And so one of the things that I love about Sonny is that he's always been super intentional about connecting with our kids when it comes to their walk with God. So when he's talking about dinners, you know, we would do, you know, we would say, okay, what was the best part of your day? What was the worst part of your day? And then we would talk about, you know, why that is. Um, even now, I mean, Ashlyn, she's in the back. Ashlyn's going to college. Josiah's, you know, in high school. And we still do every morning, we try to, um, every morning to do like a touch point. We're, um, you know, all working on how to use our study Bibles and, you know, and, and even if we don't do that, we always make sure that we take a few minutes to pray. We pray when we're in the car, when we're going to, um, you know, different events and things like that because it's every little opportunity that we get. And again, this isn't, we don't know it all. I mean, this is all stuff that people have told us to do. And I go, oh, praise God, because we really don't know what we're doing. But it's just making the most of every opportunity and not thinking that, well, if they're involved in this, they're involved in this, that's gonna take care of it because it doesn't. Those are great things, but they're not gonna substitute what we as parents can give them. Amen. No, I think, I, I didn't understand how important all these little things were as far as, guys, we gotta put our cell phones away in the car yeah. if our kids are in the car. It's too good of an opportunity. <clears throat> Dinner times, wake up times, bed times, any time that you can isolate anywhere, and, I'm, and I mean it this sincerely, anywhere from two uninterrupted minutes to five interrupted minutes, that's prime time to plant a seed. Even if it's, hey, I want you to know, I know you had that test today. I just want you to know I prayed for your test today. Mm -hmm. I, knew, I knew God, I knew you were nervous, and I wanted God to give you peace. I hope it went well. Like, even if it's just praying on the way to school that day for the test that day, these little seeds, they, they, reap, they seem insignificant in compared to big church services and children's ministry and family devotionals, but they reap the biggest harvest. The other thing, I, I always thank Keith West for this. Um, Keith West said, you know, you got to spend one-on-one -on -one time with your kids. You have to have a heart connection to your kids. And he's like, you got to be connected on a heart level. And he says, you should date your daughter. So starting when my daughter was a little baby to, the, to today, like she's still on the date train with dad. She likes campus dates, but she likes dad dates the most. Like, but like spending time, I feel bad. Let me tell you something. Some dads worry about their, their daughters. I don't feel, I don't worry about my, my daughter. I worry about the brothers. <laughs> the standard is high, brothers. The first time you don't get a door, the first time she touch a door handle, you're out. The first times you're not, she's not the center of attention, you're out. The first time she doesn't feel like a queen or a princess, you're out. I set the bar high. You're welcome. You know, but again, being connected to our kids one-on-one, -on -one, my, my son and I had guys night out, boys night out. I mean, I, I would tell him, what do you want to do? And he'd like, Krispy Kreme donuts and laser tag. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to throw up. <laughs> This is going to be like, hold on, you want to see how many Krispy Kreme donuts we can eat? Then you want me to be compact in with a bunch of little kids running around for an hour going pew, 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 like, yeah, this is going to be great. But there's something about these times that lower our kids' guards. I remember Ashlyn always tells a story when they become preteens. If you have a preteen, God bless you. If you have if you've started middle school, middle school was the hardest time for both of my kids. But I'm just going to say this. Don't give up on the relationship. We were, in a, we were on a date that my daughter at, I think, 11 or 12 didn't want to go to. And we were, in a, we were in a Panera Bread, and we'd gotten our little pastry and our drinks, and we were sitting there. And I always talked about how school, who's your best friend, what's your favorite color, all of which I stole from another brother who told me I at all time want to know what my daughter loves, what she's into, if it's unicorns. I, I want to talk about things that matter to her. And so the, he taught me. He's like, these are the things you should be talking about in these times. And so I'd go and I'd ask all these things and then she would remain quiet. She had decided that she was now too cool to hang out with dad, which is, now this is the funny part. 
So I pick up my phone, which was off limits on dates with her. You cannot, if the president was calling, he was gonna have to call back because you're on a date with her. But I pick up my phone and she said, hey, what, the girl not interested in dating me. Hey, what are you doing? You can't touch the phone. You're violating the rule. This is my time. I'm like, you're not even saying anything. She said, well, what are you doing? I said, I'm canceling all my plans. I'm canceling all my ministry appointments for the day. She goes, what? I said, I have nothing to do, and nothing better to do than wait to I hear your heart. You, there's nothing in this, in this, on this planet that's more important than you and I being close. And I'll wait as long as it takes. And she remembers that conversation. Because she said, I remember that as the day that I knew I would have no choice but to always to give you my heart. But you have, but guys, it takes intentionality, making that time. We make time for a lot of things, the gym, for work, all these kind of things. We have to make time to connect with our kids on a heart level. All right, last thing. Go ahead, baby, sorry. Oh, I thought you were going to just talk. Oh, so this was, I'm giving all credit to this one to Karen Jacques. We did a parenting devotional about five or six years ago in Denver. And you know how when you hear a parenting devotional and someone says something and you feel like, did somebody talk to them about us? Like, you just feel like the Holy Spirit has spoken through somebody. Yeah. But, but this aspect of um, consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, James 1, when you face trials of many kinds. And we actually model how to deal with challenging times and circumstances for our kids. We teach them to trust in God in those times, or we teach them to trust in the world in those times by how we react. And so I'll let Kim share the kind of the story of what Karen was sharing. So what's really kind of cool about this is if we go back to what I shared about how I was raised. So like you just didn't deal with things. Okay. If something happened, you didn't talk about it again. You just pretend like it didn't happen. And then years later, you still pretend like it didn't happen. And so, um, you know, we were raised to be conflict avoiders to, um, you know, make sure everything looks good on the outside. And so, we were at this parenting workshop, and um, Gary and Karen Jacques were sharing, and she said three words that changed my life forever. She said, we would tell our boys when something happened, if they got in trouble at school, if they failed a class, it, just whatever it was, if it was anything that they were upset or angry or hurt about. And she would say, but you know what? This is good. And they would be like, how is this good? And she's like, this is good because good is going to come from this. And I was like, oh, man, I do not feel that way. <laughs> when things happen, I'm not like, this is so good, guys. Like, this is going to be awesome. I'm like, oh, no, my God, what are we going to do? You know, because I'm a panicker. But um, it, it's interesting because so I have some chronic illnesses. Our daughter has some chronic illnesses. And I remember when we moved to, and again, like, right, you grow up in this mindset of, like, you're just like, oh, whatever, you know, you kind of negative and passive aggressive and bleh. okay. So I, my poor kids, I mean, I had chronic migraines so bad for so many years. Like, I think they probably only remember me being in bed. Like, seriously, like, I was always in the bed. And so... I remember when we first moved to Denver and Frank and Erica got with us and they were like, you know, how you, how I communicate about my illness affects how they feel, right? So if I'm always negative about, or, or not even negative about how I feel, but if I'm always like, oh man, I just don't feel good today. I mean, I'm having a really hard day. It just, you know, it's kind of a downer and then it kind of does that to them. So then when Ashlyn started getting really sick, and she got her health conditions, we're like, oh my gosh, like now she's responding the way I would respond to my health stuff, which is so negative. And then I'm listening to Karen go, this is good. This is so good. You know, and I'm like, oh my gosh. So we've had to really kind of change the way that we talk about things, the way we think about things. And I did ask my son if I could share the story. So it's, I mean, it takes a long time to change that mindset, right? Because it's just so natural to, to feel negative about something that's bad or to, to feel fearful or panicked or things like that. And so um, there was a situation. So he mentioned that our son um, is adopted. He's black, white, and Sri Lankan. Um, and he, we've had some issues, some racial issues, but earlier in this school year, 
we were on a plane um, and we get this text and said, how's your boy? He's really upset. And I'm like, what are you talking about? So I'm like calling, trying to find out. Well, he had been playing basketball after school with some classmates and he got called the N-word. And it was not the first time, but he was hot. I mean, he was heated. He had become a Christian earlier that year. He was angry. And so um, by the grace of God, another ministry couple was with them. He's also an adopted black man. So he was like, you know, totally God walked him through it. So for two weeks, our son is stewing and stewing. And we kept saying, this is good. This is so good. Like God's going to bring good from this. And I'm like, I don't know what it is. I would like to know. And so after about two weeks, I'm like, because the, the, the dean of the school is like, I'm going to help them get resolved. Nothing had happened. So I'm about to call the school. I'm like, listen, we need to figure this out. So I drop him off and he says, no, just don't do any, just don't do anything. And I was like, okay. So I pick him up and he was like, oh, guess what? He was like, we're cool now. We're friends. And I was like, I said, oh, did, did the principal help you guys get reconciled? He was like, no. He said, I just got to thinking how horrible he must feel because so many people are upset with him because of what he said to me. He said, so I walked up to him and I said, you know what? I forgive you. And he said, the kids started crying, gave him a hug. Thank you so much. I haven't known what to say. And I, you know, you look at that moment and you go, it's horrible that it happened, but good came from it. Like, you know what I mean? Like I go, Josiah, I go, do you have any idea? You just showed him what grace and mercy look like. You know what I mean? Cause he was being outcasted by these other kids. And so I, I just remember that this is good. This is good in every situation. It has helped us so, so much. Yeah. And I, and I think that it's easy to say, but it's hard to do to consider it pure joy when we face trials of many kinds as disciples in our marriages, in our finances, in our health. But we have to model trusting in the Lord with all of our heart and leaning not on our own understanding, but in all of our ways, acknowledging him so he can make our path straight. Mm -hmm. And so, so some of this stuff is, is really hard, but this aspect of we didn't know what the answers were, guys. We were calling a lot of people in the community, getting advice about how, to, how much to push the school. We, we, when we say we're clueless, we're clueless. And the wisdom that we're giving you and things, the little things that we figured out is because we relied, we were praying a lot about it. We, we were begging God to give us wisdom. We were asking a lot of advice from people that we trusted and our family. And so all these little victories have come in the midst of all of the challenges. And so whether you find yourself like right now, you know, life is good to, to a certain degree. Both of my kids are disciples. One's in the campus ministry, one's in the high school ministry. But it is a battle for faith, not just in our own lives, but in our families. So we're finished. Thank you so much for listening. I uh, hope this has been helpful in some small way. And uh, we're going to invite the cunning hands back up. If you guys have any questions, we're, we're, we're about, we got about seven or eight minutes here before we're, I think we're supposed to be six minutes here. So if anybody has any questions, we'll take a few questions. Yeah, Kim says, don't feel obligated because we don't have very many answers. Go ahead. So to restate that question for those online, um, my response has been to, uh, sorry, to isolate my son, myself, from that family. Like, do you still have connections? Do you still have those connections? And if you do, how do you protect your kids from those things? Oh, man, that's a, that's a, oh, you, you going there, man. I thought we were going to get, like, softball questions. Golly. You know, um, I'm going to be 100% honest, and, and since we're going to go there, we're going to go there. You know, initially it was hard. It was really hard. I remember a brother shared a scripture with me where he said, Jesus said to love your enemies. And he was like, radical reconciliation is always the right answer. 
And so you got to figure out what are the best ways that you could do it in a safe, controlled environment uh, because you got to model this to your children, you know? And so that was a big thing for me uh, was to model that. And it has not been easy. I mean, my wife could testify. There's been many a times I'm on the phone and having conversations and navigating stuff, and it's been hard. Um, but I've made it my effort to make sure like my kids have a, a, a relationship, a working relationship, an understanding relationship, a loving relationship, but even an honest one, age appropriately on what's going on and where things are. And I've kind of had marks in my mind or that we've written, I've written down on when I'll let them know about our family, you know? Because I think it's important for them to be brought into that. I come from a family where there's so many secrets I mean, there ain't enough closets to hide and rugs and stuff things under, you know what I mean? Like, um, and that does its own damage, you know, in the future. And so it's super important that I'm able to have that type of transparent relationship with my children. They understand their family history. But yeah, yeah, amen. I don't know if that helps any. Yeah, I appreciate that. I feel like I've, I've been trying to tell my son specifically about my side of the family and then he develops this like negative view of it, right? Yeah. And so I need to have, I really like when you were talking about the positive, right? The positive interactions, the positive relationships. So thank Amen. you. Amen. Amen. First off, thank you so much. This was so helpful. Thank you. Um, I have a question about um, how do you know I mean, I'm sure it's like not a def, you know, a definitive answer, but I've been, you know, seeing a lot of messages these days about, you know, making sure that we don't overprotect our kids, not even from like disciples, but just in general, because kind of like what you were saying earlier, um, you know, I felt, I, I feel like sometimes I'm like, I grew up a certain way and this is why I'm strong, you know, and you know, some of that kind of thing. <laughs> but then, you know, as Christians, as disciples, could we be over bearing and overprotective because we do not want them to face obstacles and, and that sort of thing. So I just wanted to know if there's any ways of thinking around things like that because I'm like, no, I don't want them to go to any, through anything I went through that was harsh. And then I'm like, well, maybe some of those experiences, not, not anything crazy, but just normal everyday stuff. You know, how do you think through those kind of things? Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, yeah so I think, um, like, for me, I get so much advice about, like, there, there was a, a, a pretty big deal that I went through when I was my daughter's age. Actually, I was a little bit younger than her. And, you know, so much we want to protect them and not, you know, not have them, number one, think less of us because of certain things, think less of our family. We don't want them to be in that position. But, like, I did feel like, I'm like, okay, as she was getting older, 16, 17, and she's a woman, and I'm a woman, and I'm like, I probably need to, to share some things with her about my life and my history and, and bad choices that I made and what the consequences of those choices were. And so, I mean, I, I get so much advice, and I tell her as I, I feel like, you know your own kid, right? But like I tell her is I think is age appropriate. But I feel like if we're going to be, if we're going to have a relationship, because that was part of the dysfunction of my growing up, is we didn't talk about anything. So I didn't know anything. So no, I wasn't taught anything. I wasn't, I didn't learn from examples or anything like that because you just pretended like it didn't happen. So I have purposefully tried to be so open and honest with her as it's age appropriate, because I feel like that's how she's, because like you said, well, I've been through all this, that's what made me so strong. But actually hearing how those things happened, I think helps her to see, oh, okay, if, if, if my parents can get through that, I can get through this. You know, and you do always, like I always worry, like am I making her feel bad about people in my family? No, she's, you know, she can form her own thoughts and opinions. So I would just say get tons of advice about, you know, things that you feel like you want to share, maybe, or that you should share at some point. But to me, it's all about being age appropriate. Got it. Thank, thank you. Uh -huh. All right, well, this will be, this will be the last one because we want to be on time. We want to be sensitive to, to anything else, right? Do we have anything else over here? Oh, okay, never mind. 
Take all your time you want. <laughs> <laughs> Hope, hopefully it's more of the softball questions. Yes. So it did sound like a few of you guys had gone through counseling yourself to deal with a lot of these things. What would be some pointers that you guys would give in finding a good counselor to help you walk through this? Because there's a plethora of resources, I feel like, and different types of counselors. What would be some things that helped you guys and some things that you guys have found through those journeys? So I'll, I'll tell you from our family's perspective, we, I'm sorry, you need the mic. I need the mic. I'm sorry. Hop I'll, along. No, I'll tell you from our perspective, there are so many disciples yes. who are mental health professionals. And so what I always do is we've gone, whether it's my daughter or my wife or me or whoever it's been, we've gone, hey, here is generally what we're dealing with. What kind of therapy counselors do you know of people? And so we've tried to network that way. Even if it's not a disciple, they have the clinical knowledge of knowing kind of what therapies historically with the research kind of work with different traumas and challenges and things like that. Uh, so whether it's cognitive behavior therapy or something like that. So I always go to disciples first and then usually they can at least point me in a direction, the, the, the clinical professionals, the counselors, um, uh, to like what kind of counselor they think would be best for me. And sometimes you honestly, we're blessed in some places to actually have mental health professionals in our churches if you're in bigger churches. Thank you. He's seen everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's seen all of us and all of y'all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's lived through those preteen years mm -hmm. with us and our kids. And he'll say, um, that minister who left, who went to Colorado, he was a real one. Mm -hmm. I don't say that a lot about a whole lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so, and the uniqueness of who he is, because he has his own uniqueness, trust me. Mm -hmm. How do we, how do we pick your place, uh, bridge our humanity, our feelings, mm. and being real with him? Because he like, he kind of wanted to come today, but he didn't. Yeah. He was here yesterday. And once again, you know, anything that doesn't go right, you know, it stands out to him. Mm -hmm. And so when I said to my wife, it shouldn't have mattered. We should have been able to say, oh, we forgot to ask, can he get a pass? Can he be here? What do we do? What do we do? Mm -hmm. It was like it was some kind of something. And to me, that bothered me because mm -hmm. it's like we want anybody who's interested in any piece of the kingdom of God to get that little piece. Mm -hmm. Do we want to put a price on that? So how do we, you know, where do we need to be to kind of know how to do better than what we've done in the past? When they say, you know, all I can say is, we messed up people, but we love God and we're trying to help you to see that. That's a, it's better to be who you are loving God versus like everybody else out there trying to figure it out as they go. Amen. What's your name? Lonnie. Lonnie? Uh, that's a big question, brother. That's like, a, how, how are we going to change the world? <laughs> like, <laughs> so I can't, I don't know if I can answer that question, but I can't say I understand your sentiment. Like, I, I really do. And, you know, I, I know, you know, this, this past two years have been hard period on all of us from the political stuff to the racial stuff to the pandemic to the economic stuff like to the like it's just so many things going on one thing that I pray for myself like forget everyone else I just pray for myself is that I could live out my faith as authentic as I possibly can you know um and I could be as honest, I can't answer for everyone else. And I think sometimes we, we, we try too hard to have an answer for everyone else when the only person that you could really have an answer for is yourself. Um, and really pointing that back to people, like, I can't, I'm not, I, I can't. I don't know, you, you don't know me, we all have different stuff, you know? And so we could be, as, as, a, as a disciple, you could be as authentic and as honest as you can uh, with people. 
I know me and my kids, when we have our prayer times, we pray about the stuff that we're struggling with. And I try to let my kids know, yeah, daddy preaches, but daddy is far from perfect. You, you know, they know, and they have no problem telling my stuff sometimes. I'm like, yo, 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 hey, hey, pause. Like, you know what I mean? Time out, flag on the play. Like, and, but I mean, it is that level of like, just being authentic and not trying to present this image, but present myself and present how God is transforming me to be more like him. And that's, that's really it. Like, I, I don't even try to have an answer for the church. I don't have a, try to have an answer for ICOC. I don't try to have an answer for anyone else. Only person I can answer for is me. And that's, you know, what I try. And can I just share um, just something also is that we have to understand also like the spiritual battle. And Satan wants your children. Satan wants our marriage. Like that's why it's always after, you know, being attacked. So even praying specifically, like if you know he's coming to certain things, like that he'll be surrounded by certain individuals that's really gonna build him up and help him mm -hmm. because it's that community aspect as well. But understanding ahead of time, like certain things will come up, but that's even just for everyone, all of us to really diminish our faith, to really, you know, make a struggle or, or discourage. Like if anything, yeah, he should be here, but even if it's just through fellowship, even if it's through a lunch, like there's something that could be done and there's nothing beyond God's redemption, you know? Uh, thank you guys, that was awesome. Uh, appreciate just your vulnerability. I have like a quick two-parter, Kim, right? Kim, first one's for you. I relate a lot to what you said about just your family's very dysfunctional in a way that is not maybe as obvious, right? The, the passive aggressiveness, et cetera. How did you or how do you still kind of deal with and uh, work through that, right? Even, even now in a family where I have some disciples in my family, it's, it's still, those roots are still there, right? And so I think that's difficult. And then the part two maybe for Paris or, or anybody else who wants to comment is, um, with the brother that asked the question about that safe environment, um, any practicals for when you do have that, those times, right? Like how do you, how do you safeguard your family to know, okay, this is not like, this was our plan. This isn't going according to plan. We're, we're going to fail or, or where are the boundaries? Where are the lines? Like how do you discern what is healthy? What's not? And maybe just some practicals all, all around that. So for my part, Honestly, I, I'm almost 53, and I did not address any of it until probably, I don't know, maybe five, six years ago. And so how I deal with it now is I call it out. Like, I just have to. Like, whether it's, you know, with my dad, like, before, I, I'm just not going to address it. I'm going to pretend like it didn't happen. I'm going to act like that didn't hurt me, you know, and... And, and when we talk about therapy, like, yeah, I had been to therapy several times over the years. It wasn't until, like, four years ago that, I mean, like, it all came to a head. And so, like, um, just in my relationships with people in my family and just hurts that I had that we, were ne that we never talked about. And you just, oh, everybody's so great and happy. And, you know, we're all so religious and spiritual. And I'm like, we are messed up people. And our relationships are shallow. They are not deep. And so, but I had so much hurt that I didn't really get serious about therapy and counseling until about four years ago. And by the grace of God, I, there is a sister in our church that I see professionally, and she has helped me more than all the other therapists that I ever saw put together. But to answer your question, I have to call it out now. Like, I did a, I, I preached a women's day, and I was going to talk about this particular very traumatic event in my life that we just had not talked about in 35 years because why would we talk about it and I called my mom and I said I'm talking about it and you're going to be sitting there and you're going to be uncomfortable so if you need to tell your sisters or your mom my 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 memo right then you need to let them know because I'm tired of not talking about it anymore because it completely shaped who I was 
And so to not be able to ever talk about it and let's just all pretend like it didn't happen, I'm like, I'm to an age, I'm not doing that anymore. Amen. So. Um, there, there is a time limit. I guess I, I don't want anyone to feel like you have to yeah. stick yeah. in, you know, like, but, oh, okay, there's some people who really want to. <laughs> all right. Well, I, yeah. Oh, I, I did want to give a quick answer to his. I know you asked me a question. I was going to throw it real fast. I just don't believe that there's anything safe. And I think as Christians, sometimes we want everything to be safe all the time. And I think we got to be okay with things being messy, things being uncomfortable. The, the whole thing that I try to hone into is with discipleship is God teaches you how to be who you need to be in the middle of a mess. And so you can't try to avoid the mess. Um, it's the, really navigating who do you need to be in the midst of the mess. And so I just, I mean, in, in that, you got to ask the Holy Spirit and, and pray, get much advice on how to navigate it. I just would encourage, don't always try to run from messy situations. You know, I'm sorry. No, actually, yeah. that was very helpful. Um, I wanted, with what he had asked, the first question that came across with um, dealing with a lot of previous family trauma with within your own family growing up and how different or how they cover things up, how they don't deal with it, all of that. Um, I recently had to come to terms with a lot of it and realize that I do need to deal with and mm. get messy. And, and now I'm like, oh gosh, my, I have kids now, so like they're subjected to a lot of the, the manipulation yeah. or the drama or, and they don't know where it's coming from. Part of my question, I guess, is when the triggers arrive and they get me going, I, you know, which has been recently, the past few weeks, I, I, I don't even recognize who I am wow. when those triggers are going off and wow. alarms. And I get that, yes, the, the major answer has been get into therapy or fix these problems because you can't keep them tucked away in a closet and only deal with them once a year when you see your family. Um, but it was difficult for me and one of my triggers happened and it was like, gosh, I don't want this person with my kids. I don't mm. want them to be able to manipulate my children the way they manipulated me. And I, 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 they need to have this relationship. This is a vital relationship to their development, grandparents being, but I, I don't want them to do this. And how do I, if they haven't addressed their issues that they put on me and I'm addressing my triggers and issues, they still have their issues. They're still the same person that they were and now I'm gonna give you my children to mess them up too? I, you know, yeah. what do you do with that? Mm. Because I can fix me, I don't, I can't fix them. Yeah. 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 The only thing I would say is the thing that I've learned in counseling is that and listen, I love my family. I love my parents. I love my siblings. My mom only raised me the way she was raised, right? They are raised the way they raised us the way they were raised. And sometimes they don't know any better. But what I've come to understand is that at their ages, they are probably not going to change, right? So I have to adjust. This is all my therapy learning. I have to adjust the way I view that relationship for myself and go, if I can accept them for where they are, then when we're with them, we're gonna enjoy our time. And beyond that, that's all, that's all we, we can do. And I do think, you know, if there's like actual threats, obviously you've gotta be, you know, safe and secure about, you know, what you, what you allow. But I just think coming to an understanding that it's probably not gonna change and just coming to a place yourself. And so that's why I went back into therapy because I'm like, I am not doing well at all. And I'm like, I'm talking like I was in full blown panic attacks, couldn't drive for three weeks. Like, I'm like all because something triggered and I was like, this is not cool because I have limited time with my kids. And if I don't get myself figured out, they're not ever gonna think that it's okay for them to get themselves figured out. But I think for me is the biggest thing is just accepting people for where they are and, you know, trying to adjust from there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add something to that. So I think there are situations. So my dad uh, was an alcoholic and he would drink every weekend. And so when we had our kids, when I had my daughter for the first time, navigating, 
he could, we could go there, there could be drugs, there could be guns, he could be hung over, he could be drunk. So how do you tell him, you're really jacked up and I don't want to bring her? I, I just, what I had to do was I had to not be in a place where I was mad at my dad. So the first thing you have to do is you have to see your dad through the lenses of Jesus or your, or your parents. Okay, now I know what, that's, so you might take a while. You might, you know, like, I'm, there ain't a, enough a therapy in the world to get me there. But, you know, you got to get there first, right? And then, then you have to do boundaries. I told my dad, I said, listen, I said, I want my kids to adore you. That's where I had to start. I want my kids to adore you. I didn't start with their dysfunction. I started with how I wanted their relationship to be. Does that make sense? And I said, I can never bring her here when you're hungover or you're drunk. I'll never let her see you that way. You will always be the best grandpa in her eyes. And I will protect that image no matter what it takes. And he was like, oh, yeah, 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 I got it. And then two months later, I show up at his house on a Saturday morning. I drove an hour and a half one way so he could spend the whole day with Ashlyn. And I got to the door, and he was hungover. Now, I was mad. I was like, I knew I shouldn't have given him this. Here he goes again. going to mess up somebody else's life. Like, I, I get it. But I left, and I remembered. I got to give him all the chances that God gave me. So I called him that day, and I said, I'll bring her back again tomorrow. And I had to cancel a lot to bring her back. If you'll be sober and you'll be in a good place. But it was really crazy because my dad ended up, he, my dad ended up changing. He didn't become a disciple, but he would not drink the whole weekend if he got a chance to see Ashlyn. And he actually was a horrible father, but he actually ended up being an incredible grandpa. And I think that was because my willingness to show grace, but you have their boundaries. That doesn't, right? I, I, he, it's not, the, it's not like I just got to meet them where they're at if, if I feel like it's going to do harm. Does that make sense to their relationship with the grandparent or to my kid? So it's okay to have the boundaries. But if the boundary is because you're jacked, this, is, this conversation never goes well. You're really jacked up. You got issues. You messed me up, and I ain't letting you mess my kids up. There's only one way to respond to that. Oh, yeah, well, you're still here. You're still doing okay. You turned out like this is... It goes nowhere else after that. Like, your life ain't that bad. You ain't on the street. You could have been an orphan. You could have been in Africa. You could have, like, like, right? Like, at that point, there's nothing constructive going to happen. Does that make sense? But, it, but, it, but I think being humble, being gracious in a relationship, but you can do that and still, I want to say this, and still have boundaries. So.